Okay, welcome everyone. I'd like to uh, take this time and opportunity to welcome everybody to uh, to Netch's webinar on viscoelasticity. My name is John Casola. I'm a technical specialist on the rheology product line. This uh, this webinar will be given in three parts, and I will introduce each part as we go through it. So don't be surprised when I start uh, sounding like we're beginning this from the beginning again. I believe that we should have uh, the opportunity for, for questions. So if during the course of the uh, discussion you have questions, please just put them in the chat. And as you can see, each part is labeled A, B, and C. We'll start off with the introduction of viscoelasticity, where we'll do non-destructive testing. We'll look at oscillation type sweeps, oscillation amplitudes. And then we'll move into uh, part B, in which we'll look at oscillation frequency sweeps, single frequency measurements, and some of their applications. And then finally, we'll move into part C, where we'll look at the, the difference between viscometry measurements versus oscillation measurements. So typical testing in rheology, we generally break it up into two major categories. Deformation, oscillation is the, the mode. Cyclic testing might be another way to put it. But it's, it's low amplitude, non-destructive testing. And the other category would be flow, viscometry, viscosity, where we're shearing a material. When we do our oscillation tests, we start quantifying the viscoelasticity of the material. We're able to look at the sample and understand its structure a little bit more clearly. We get, we get mechanical properties out of the material and we can start classifying them accordingly. We can look at some simple things like whether a material settles over time. We can look at how the material flows, how will it pump. Um, the typical experiments in this mode of operation would be oscillation or static creep, where we can put a, st a stagnant load on a material and watch how it changes over time. Um, conversely, we can apply a load and watch how the material relaxes over time. In the flow category, we're going to look at, at mimicking most processes where we can look at the effective resistance to flow. We can identify how thick something is or how thin, how something like an uh, example of paint or, or a food product might, might pump. And the typical experiments are in, in viscometry. But the key to take away is that, you know, all materials are not completely solid or not completely liquid. And what we want to do is identify how different are they in these modes of measurement. And the category obviously would be viscoelastic. Viscous would be if it were just plain, you know, simple flow and elastic if it was much more um, solid like. So when we look at things like paint. You'd like to have some of these, these characteristics throughout its, its operational process. You'd like to know that the paint, when, when uh, mixed, will stay a mixed material. It's not going to separate during the course of its use. But you'd also like to know that it's going to flow easy when you start applying it. You don't want it to flow too easy or you're going to make a mess. It's going to, it's going to drip and splatter as it's, it's applied. Um, likewise, after it's on the surface, you don't want it to, to run or drip off because it's too low a viscosity. And if it's too high a viscosity, it may leave it may leave ridges or or um, orange peel like surfaces as a result of of it not leveling and settling. So you want you want to be able to characterize the material to understand how it's going to perform and and be the product that you're looking for it to be. 
And again, we're just looking at paint, but it, it falls into many categories. We could be looking at things like ketchups. We could look into, um, you know, food products like like uh, puddings, mayonnaise, yogurts. But when we paint, we do want it to make sure that it's fluid-like, but we don't want it too fluid. We want to make sure that we're getting the, the right coverage and coating on the wall or on the surface of, of, uh, of interest. So how do we do this? You know, instruments like, like a rheometer measure uh, very fundamental characteristics. We're gonna be measuring five basic things. We're gonna be measuring temperature. We're gonna be measuring angle of displacement, which we will relate to strain or strain rates. We measure the, the force that's being generated or measured, torque, which is stress, uh, any normal force that's being generated as a result of pushing it, and the temperature that we're uh, characterizing our materials at. So when we start looking at deformation modes like oscillation, our goal is to be able to oscillate the material and look at the forces that are being generated as a result of, of applying the oscillation. So if we had loaded a sample between the plates here and we bring the plate down, your sample would be this green area. And if we look at, at the material as layers, we can see that as this plate on top, this, this upper plate oscillates back and forth, the sample goes from a, a state in which it is just the way we loaded it to dragging these layers in directions that are associated with the rotation of the plate. So these are the, the two parts of the measurement that we're looking to, to, uh, to characterize. So when you were in your viscosity session, you talked about how the, the uh, samples will rotate continuously and measure a force. But in this situation, we're going to be, we're going to be oscillating the material And we're going to do this in a non-destructive way. So we're just going to gently perturb it. We're still going to measure the stress that's associated with the forces that are applied per unit area and whatever strain or displacement the, the, uh, the plate moves in the course of making the measurement. So from this, we get two major measurements. We get stress and strain. From stress and strain, we can measure the direct stiffness. Stress over strain is modulus. It relates directly to the shear modulus of the material. If you're used to doing measurements on solid samples, you're used to looking at hooking behavior. You're looking at Young's modulus. Shear modulus is similar to Young's modulus. It's a factor of three different. So we can calculate the phase angle. So phase angle is a new component that we're going to talk about. And we're looking at whatever lag there is associated with applying a force to the material or applying a strain to the material and seeing the resultant movement from the sample. Different types of materials have different lags. So in this case, if we were to push the sample with a load, how the load responds could very well be different. And this difference relates to the viscoelastic properties in the material. What we're going to do as I move forward is I'm going to show you a little more in detail how that how that measurement is made and what does it really mean. So for a purely elastic material like a solid, you know, we can look at things um, like a spring would be purely elastic. And if we looked at at something that's purely viscous, we could look at things like water, honey, syrups, things that flow very easily. <clears throat> 
And in nature, everything falls between these two types of material behavior. Purely elastic solid behavior is referred to being in phase, where it's all elastic behavior. You have what's called a, a, uh, a solid-like response. So if I were to push the sample, the sample force that's being measured is going to be in phase. So these peaks always align. If we're working with a viscous material, the behavior is significantly different. If we were to push the sample, the sample response is going to be not driven by how you how you push it. Um, like when we when we pull a, pull or push a spring, it's going to behave on velocity, and I'll explain exactly how that works in a minute. So if we had a spring here, and I start from the spring in a relaxed position and begin to push the spring down, the forces that are generated are completely in phase with that spring. As I relax the spring, the forces relax. If I were to pull the spring, the forces follow in phase with whatever I'm doing to that spring. So just using your hand as your rheometer, you can make this measurement yourself. If I were to push the spring down and hold it, the forces would stay constant. But if I look at this, you know, with, with a, a viscous fluid, something like water, it could be honey, anything that, that has Newtonian type behavior, what you would see is as follows. If I started from, from um, point A in the tank and I move my hand in the water to point B, you know, what do I feel you know, besides wet? Well, what you'd feel is when you're starting at, at one end of the tank, your hand's not moving really at all. So your force is zero that you're feeling on your hand. But as the hand starts to accelerate through the center of the tank, your force that you're feeling is getting larger. After we reach the center of the tank, we start decelerating to reach the end of the tank. As we decelerate to reach the end of the tank, the force that you're feeling on your hand drops back to zero. And if I change directions and I start pulling back towards A, I'd see that, I'd feel that the force is again building to a, to a maximum that corresponds to the center of the tank. So the forces that we're feeling on a viscous material are not position dependent, but they're velocity dependent. The velocity of my hand through, through the water. If you were standing at the beach in, in knee deep water, you know, it's easy to move around slowly, but it's much more difficult to run through it. So the force that you feel is gonna be proportional to the velocity that you, you apply. Unlike working with a spring, where the forces are always going to be proportional to how much displacement you impart on that spring. The more you, you impart a force, the larger the displacement you're going to feel. Or likewise, the, the more you displace the spring, the greater the force. So when we start looking at this, we start looking at simple, simple materials that, that you can relate to. In this case, let's look at something like a yogurt. You know, a yogurt, it could be a pudding. But when we start looking at the actual structure of these materials in comparison to something like a honey, the honey always flows. If you tip the container, it'll immediately start to flow. If you tip the container in honey, it uh, in the uh, uh, of the of the yogurt, it doesn't flow. And that's because the yogurt has an elastic behavior that that's, dominates the material property under low stress or low strain conditions. So it behaves as a solid. If you were to, if you were to get the material to pour, if you had a large enough dollop on the, on the spoon and you, you were able to start shaking it off, it doesn't flow off the spoon. What it does is it just plops off it and it just sits wherever it lands. There's a general structure to the material. 
it doesn't flow afterwards. If you, if you dig into a container, it might even leave ridges. And it may not last forever, but it, but it will last in short times. When you work with smooth materials, materials that flow, like a honey, a syrup, even water, it pours, it strings, it settles with a smooth finish. So these different behaviors we can characterize using the rheology in oscillation. So we start breaking it down. What are we really looking at? Well, we have to we have to uh, first standardize on some of the terms that we're going to be be uh, characterizing over the course of this discussion. We look at modulus. Modulus is nothing more than stress over strain. But if we take phase angle into consideration, we can start um, deconvoluting the uh, storage modulus into components. We break it down into an elastic component and a viscous component. The elastic component is a storage modulus. The viscous component is a loss modulus. The loss defines the energies that are lost as a result of, of putting work into the material. You can, uh, you can look at elastic modulus as, as the stored energy. So when we start looking at phase angle in this regard, if something has, has a very low phase angle, and low phase angle is defined by anything less than 45 degrees, it's behaving more solid-like. If the phase angle is greater than 45 degrees, it's going to behave more liquid-like. So we start relating these two components to the complex modulus, the overall modulus of the material, it's, uh, it's probably easier to look at it as, as a, uh, an equation that I should have had on the screen here, and I, I, I apologize, but it's the root of the sum of the squares. So g prime squared plus g double prime squared, if we take the square root of that, would be g star. But you can look at it this way as well. So if we have stress over strain and we look at the sine of the phase angle, it'll give us the ratio of, of how much the material is, is fluid-like. If you look at the cosine, it's going to give you how much the material is elastic-like. So it's all tied to the phase angle of the material. We can take this one step further and we can look at how this relates to shear viscosity by looking at what's called dynamic viscosity. And dynamic viscosity is going to be G double prime divided by frequency. And we'll take a look at that a little later. So in any material you want to characterize, you have to understand at least fundamentally what we're going to, to, to look at when trying to characterize it. So if we're in, in an oscillation test, we could look at, at measuring data as a function of amplitude. How much do we push it? How much force do we apply to it? How much do we strain it? And see how the material behaves. Likewise, we could look at how much, how time dependent the material is by maybe changing the frequency of the periods in our cyclic testing. When we start looking at these materials, we want to understand not just the mechanical properties of the material, but, but how robust is that measurement? The first thing we need to identify is, are we testing the material in a range that's, that's completely non-destructive? And, and the way to do that would be to run the amplitude test first. If we look at running an amplitude test, we start at very low amplitudes, and we keep stretching it more and more and more and more until we find a breaking point. So if we understand where the breaking point is, we can also you know, characterize where it's not broken. And that's referred to as the linear viscoelastic region in the material. When we start looking at frequency response, we start looking at the behavior of these materials as a function of time. And we wanna do that operating within the linear viscoelastic region. So what really is the linear viscoelastic region? Well, if we did something as simple as pulling a rubber band, or we could be putting weights on a, on a spring, 
we're looking for how it stretches as a function of force. So we can look at the 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 strain or the the deformation distance for an applied force. And when we start deviating from a linear behavior, we've gone nonlinear. And nonlinear is where this reaches the, the breaking point in the material. So if we were to characterize the, the stretching of that, that rubber band or even just putting weights on a spring, you can identify where you end up with a linear behavior, where the material is, is linearly performing for each applied load or deformation versus when the material starts to break down and fail. So if we looked at something like the mayonnaise or the, the yogurt that we were, were testing before, you'd see that it has a behavior very similar to this. It has a, a plateau region where the material isn't changing as a function of amplitude until we reach an amplitude in which the structure starts to completely break down. So our goal is to be able to test materials in this region because it's very reproducible. It tells you about the state of the material. So how do we do this? Within the, within the R-Space software, we have an amplitude sweep. It's under toolkit number one. And its purpose is to determine the linear viscoelastic region of a material. When you, when you open up this test, it'll prompt you for some starting points. It has some defaults in place. You could work with those or you could change them. It's, it's effort to, to program the test for you is, is pretty straightforward. It's, it enters the information into the actions that define the process of applying an amplitude sweep to the material. So here we are gonna set a shear strain starting ending, an applied frequency, samples per decade. You'll end up with results that hopefully look something like this, where you'll see that the material behavior is not changing with strain until we start to roll off. What's nice about setting up this test is you really can't make a mistake. You can go to very low starting points, go to very high ending strains, and the material will be tested within that range. And if, if for some reason the material um, breaks structure sooner, it'll, it'll just stop for you. So as you can see, this particular material, it has a very high G prime. It has a lower G double prime. So the material is, is in a, in a solid-like state until it starts to break structure. The phase angle is relatively low until the structure starts to break and it starts to go up. So a zero degree phase shift is purely elastic. A 90 degree phase shift is purely viscous. So as the structure breaks, this material is going through a transition from a more solid-like material to a more, more liquid-like material. So to summarize, the concept of doing some viscoelastic measurements gives you greater insight into the nature of the material you're working with. The goal is to try to understand these materials at a near rest condition. So small amplitudes, we're barely disturbing it. It's ideal for doing testing where we can identify the linear viscoelastic regions of a material so that we can use that information for further tests. We can also use um, this type of testing to characterize materials over, of, over time, over temperature, and see how materials behave. And we're going to look at that a little bit further as we go forward. The two key things to take away is that we're really looking at, at deconvoluting modulus into storage and loss modulus. If you're familiar with uh, DMA type testing, solids testing, it's the equivalent of E prime and E double prime and there's a factor of three between them.
details of the first three common oscillation measurement types. Clearly, we, uh, we looked at amplitude sweep. We're looking at understanding the linear viscoelastic region and, and uh, taking that information and using it to program other tests because the goal is to make measurements in a non-destructive way. And with that, we finished part A. So thank you. Let's see if there's any questions. All right. So welcome to uh, part B of typical viscoelastic measurements. Again, my name is John Casola. I'm a technical specialist in the rheology group. We're going to spend a little more time looking a little deeper into oscillation frequency sweeps, single frequency measurements. When we look at frequency sweeps, it gives us a piece of information. It's a lot like a fingerprint of the material. It's very unique to each, each formulation, each material type. And then from that fingerprint, we can also quickly identify basic characteristics of the material. So if you look at, at materials in which the, there is a, a larger G prime than G double prime, the larger G prime, red, than the G double prime, the material is more viscoelastic solid. If the material has a change, uh, has no change in its properties, it falls into the category of gel. Depending on what the differences are between here, it could also be considered a solid. If the material is more viscous than elastic, then it would be a viscoelastic liquid. Now, the key part of this is states change depending on the time element associated with the measurement, so the frequency. And we're gonna look at how we're gonna make those measurements as we go forward. So toolkit two allows you to perform a frequency sweep on your material. Starting frequency, ending frequency. How much strain? We talked a little bit about strain or the linear viscoelastic region before in part, one, part A. Ideally, you want to make sure that this value is going to be within the range of the linear viscoelastic region because any small variation as a result of this being outside the linear viscoelastic region will give you very variable results. The default to keep in mind is if you're working with materials that, that are dispersions, things like suspensions, foams, anything with, with a high degree of particulates in it, things like a toothpaste, your, per, your percent strain values are gonna be very low, much lower than 1%. If you're working with polymeric type systems, the materials have very large molecules, the strains can be much larger. They could be anywhere from a tenth of a percent on up to, to, to 10 or 20% strain. So what do we mean when we start talking about things like polymers or, or property changes as a function of, of time? If we took something like uh, silly putty, uh, play putty is, is something we work with a lot. It's a, uh, a polydimethylsiloxane material. If you just pull it, it stretches very nicely. But if you pull it, pull it very quickly, it shatters. So the behavior is significantly different depending on the time element associated with the measurement. If I roll this material up into a ball and throw it on the ground, it will bounce very nicely. All of the energy that goes into impact at a high rate of deformation will spring back out and the ball will bounce. If you looked at it, you'd see no, no, no surface change on the ball as a result of bouncing it. But if I set that ball on a table and give it some time, it'll flow very slowly into a puddle. 
So behaviors of this material at different frequencies are going to give you different behavior. So as you can see from this data, at low frequencies, the material is more liquid-like. And at high frequencies, the material is more solid-like. Phase angle goes from a liquid-like phase angle of greater than 45 degrees at low frequencies to a low phase angle at high frequencies. High frequencies are very short time scales. Low frequencies are very long time scales. Another fun toy to play with, kinetic sand. And you can see how soft this material is. And if you really want to look at things over long time periods, the University of Queensland in Australia started an experiment back in 1927. And it was reset in 1930. And it's running to this day. There's a camera keeping an eye on things. There's a clock. And it's keeping an eye of this material flowing. If you take a hammer to this, it shatters like glass. Yet, if you put these shards in the beaker over a long period of time, you'll see that it'll flow out like a liquid. Very similar to, to uh, antique glass in old houses. You'll find that the thickness at the bottom of the glass is much thicker than the, the thickness at the top of the glass. It's flowing just over a very long time scale. So you can see. You can see the little bead at the bottom here forming before it drops. So let's talk about looking at, at single frequency measurements. We talked about varying the frequency, looking at things over, over a number of, of frequencies in order to look at, at the, the effects of time on a material. But if you run things at a single frequency, we can learn quite a bit about a material as well. If we hold a frequency constant, we can keep the amplitude constant and we can watch changes that are taking place in the material. For example, um, if you were to put an adhesive of some sort of glue, an epoxy, let's say, between the plates, we can monitor the curing process of that material with time. You can do it isothermal, you can change temperature. You could also look at things like sedimentation. If you put a material in, a, in the sample that, in the, uh, in the instrument that has a tendency to change with time, things like ketchup. When you first put it in, it's very, it's very uh, low viscosity, it pours. But as it sits, you'll see that the structure builds. You could look at how long it takes for that structure to build. To set up a test, we do something with toolkit number three, where we can monitor changes. We can define the frequency of interest. Most tests are, are, are performed at, at landmark frequencies like one hertz, 10 hertz, one radian a second, 10 radians a second. Simple points for comparison. We define the overall time that we're interested in running it and how much amplitude do we want to apply. In this case, it's really important to make sure we're in the linear viscoelastic region because we really don't want to disturb the material while we're testing it. We'd like it to form or change naturally. And we can define what is our sampling intervals? How often do we want to take a data point? So if we looked at something like an epoxy or a glue, we can see the material starts out more viscous, the material flows. It's easy to transfer onto whatever we're trying to hold together. Over the course of time, if we're holding it isothermal, you'll see that it goes through a transition and becomes more elastic until we're in a full cure region. 
It also gives you a measure of how high a modulus it, it ends up. So it gives you a measure of its strength or stiffness. By understanding the low temperature, I mean the low um, um, modulus characteristics, you'll have a better idea of whether this material is going to flow more than you need it to. You want to apply it to a place and you want it to stay there. Too low of too low of a modulus, too low of a viscosity, it may flow off. So, in summary, frequency sweeps. If you hold the strain fixed and you're testing within the linear viscoelastic region, the frequency of the signal is adjusted to record the viscoelastic spectrum. Again, the, the purpose of understanding the viscoelastic spectrum is to get a better understanding of material behavior. If you're holding single frequency oscillation and apply a constant strain and look at it over time, you can see what happens to that material with time. How is it changing? If, if it has structure, how much time does it take to build structure? What happens when you break structure? Does it recover? If you're working with, with cross-linking materials like a glue, you know, how long does it take to reach that point in which the material now is dominated by the, the elastic behavior? And I'd like to thank you for your attention. This was the end of part B. And welcome, this is part C, viscometry versus oscillation. And again, I'm John Casola, technical specialist rheology. So in part C, we're gonna spend our time looking at differences between viscometry measurements versus oscillation measurements. You know, we've, we have discussed in a number of different uh, rheological tests. And, and when we look at rheology, it's like building a picture of material behavior. And, and from my perspective, it's, it's also like looking for your car keys when they're lost. There's, there's a number of ways to characterize a material, to look for, for information about it. But, but the goal is to start in the most obvious places first, to look at how that information relates to the nature of the materials you're, you're testing and, and what you're looking to learn from those materials. But in some cases, what you're looking to learn is not always as obvious as we'd like. So we have to keep looking a little deeper until we can find exactly what, what applies to your application. So we're gonna cover some of this. We're gonna look at the, the, uh, the information associated with viscosity and oscillation and how, how we're gonna link those together. So we were looking at the, the, uh, the play putty earlier. And we have two sets of data here. The question is, you know, how does all this apply? In this case, this material has a phase angle that's clearly going into an elastic behavior. So it goes from a very low, a high phase angle at low frequencies and to a low phase angle at high frequencies. We, we indicated that this material will flow over long periods of time. And this says that over long periods of time, the material is going to be viscous dominated. We also said that if you, if you pulled it very quickly at high rates of deformation, it will snap. If you roll it into a ball and throw it, it'll bounce. And we can see that at high rates of deformation, the material is much more elastic than viscous. If we look at the viscosity of this material, you can see that as you get to lower shear rates, the material becomes Newtonian in behavior. And it has a value that's, that's in this order of magnitude, somewhere between 10 to the three and, let's see, one ten, yeah, between 10 to the three and 10 to the four. Pascal seconds. So at rest, we're able to identify the viscosity of this material. We can also see how the material is going to flow at higher rates of deformation. 
we start looking at, at materials like hand creams. Materials like this can be referred to as viscoelastic solids or semi-solids. They're very thick, very paste-like. You can see that the structure is rigid. If you, if you dig into it, it leaves deformation. So we start characterizing materials like these, you'll see that in this case, the elastic component over the entire test is always higher than the viscous component, which tells us that over the course of this test, this material is always going to be solid-like. If over long periods of time, these crossed, this might then flow, and you'd have a material that would, would give you a smooth appearance if left in the container over a long period of time. This material, by its, by its nature, from the data that we're seeing, is always going to be very rigid looking. When you look at the flow properties of the material, you can see that the material has a yield stress in it. It has structure. It's not going to give us any, any zero shear viscosity plateau. The lower in shear rate we go, the higher in viscosity we're going to see. So let's take a look at some of these materials. So you can see the time scales that we're working with by looking at the, the hands of the clock, but the play putty will flow over time. The kinetic sand, primarily due to its high solids content as a dispersion, is much more elastic in behavior, um, elastic solid, when all of those particles, um, you know, sit and, and get close to each other and, and almost form a, a rigid network. Same thing happens with things like uh, ketchup, toothpaste. Highly filled materials behave a lot like this one. So here we go. Look at the differences in behavior. We looked at the viscosity of the play putty before, and here's the, the viscosity of the kinetic sand. While the kinetic sand, once it's been sheared, is easy, it flows. Once, once it's packed, it doesn't want to flow. It's very rigid. We'll look at the viscoelastic properties, significantly different as well. Play putty, viscously dominated at low shear rates, low frequencies, high frequencies. It's elastic dominated. This material is elastic dominated over the entire range. So in summary, you know, when you compare viscosity and viscoelastic properties of solids and liquid behavior, they're, they're significantly different. You can look at the characteristic curves and, and make judgments very easily based on what you're seeing. You can relate the, the viscosity data between the two methods of, between the two modes of operation. So um, dynamic viscosity relates to shear viscosity over a very broad range of, of uh, properties. Uh, and uh, shear rate conditions. And this is under the Cox Mertz rule. I hope you found some of this useful in getting to, uh, to know how to start making some rheological measurements. Once we get past the, the preliminary um, sections here, we can move into the fun stuff and start looking at how to characterize much more complicated materials. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call.
or email. It's john.casola at niche.com.